Hare Krishna and welcome to our virtual Sunday Feast Talk brought to you today from sunny Sage Cottage in the sunny south east of the Republic of Ireland. My name is Kormadas. Om Ajnana Timirandasya Gyananjana Salakaya Chaksurun Militam Yena Tasmai Sri Gurave Namaha. So today we're going to proceed with episode number eight of our extremely interesting reading of The Great Transcendental Adventure, my book that I've um, serialized for our uh, hearing and reading pleasure. This was a book that I put together 30 or so years ago. It outlines the history of Srila Prabhupada, the founder Acharya of the International Society for Krishna Consciousness, his visits to Australia and New Zealand between the years of 1971 and 1976. So this is episode number eight. There we go, eight. We're moving along. Now, if you recall, um, last episode, we were talking about Srila Prabhupada's uh, desire to return again to Australia to visit the devotees. He wrote, With pleasure, I have noted that you are desiring to personally uh, be present with me again and I'm also looking forward to seeing you all nice boys and girls in Australia again soon. He wrote this uh, at the end of 1971 and sure enough Prabhupada's plans were uh, solidified and we start today's reading with um, Prabhupada en route to Australia for his second of six visits. Thursday the 30th of March 1972, which is 50 years and uh, a little bit ago. Srila Prabhupada travelled with three disciples from Calcutta to Sydney via Singapore. Shama Sundara acted as his secretary, Prajumna as his servant and Sanskrit editor, and Nandakumar as his cook. Three stalwarts there. Shamasunda, Prajumna and Nandakumara, all still with us, all in their 70s. Of course, in those days, we were all teenagers. After the plane departed, Srila Prabhupada took his meal from the well-stocked tiffin containers that Nandakumara had filled before departing. Nandakumara recalls, quote, I cooked Srila Prabhupada a dry potato sabji with a lot of turmeric. Very good cook, Nanda Kumar. I had parboiled the potatoes whole, then cut them up and pan fried them, adding powdered coriander and cumin to form a nice crust. Have you had your lunch, breakfast, everyone? Be prepared to salivate. I had also packed puris and a tasty tomato chutney, the recipe for which I had got from Anand Brahmachari, Prabhupada's godbrother. Anand Brahmachari taught uh, many devotees how to cook, actually. Anand Brahmachari was the personal cook of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, Prabhupada's spiritual master. And uh, he taught Nandakumar how to make this wonderful tomato chutney. Um, tomatoes, salt, pepper with fresh meti or uh, fresh um, fenugreek leaves, along with mustard seeds and some gur, raw uh, date sugar. I had also brought chidwa, a nice combination of nuts, fried dal and crunchy chickpea flour noodles and a mango chutney. Srila Prabhupada enjoyed the prasadam and after he ate, the three of us happily ate the remnants. Prabhupada was in a very jovial mood on this leg of the trip and Prabhupada was very regulated. If it was lunchtime, he would take his lunch and it happened to be lunchtime on the plane so devotees always knew that Prabhupada would ask for his prasadam, so they were well prepared. Srila Prabhupada was scheduled to stay in Singapore for two days, because Singapore, of course, is on the way from India to Sydney. Prabhupada's headed to Sydney from Calcutta. Srila Prabhupada was scheduled to stay in Singapore for two days. One Indian gentleman, Jamanadas Bajwani, who had trade connections with Australia, had booked a large hall, 
and mailed hundreds of invitations to the local Indian community. On arrival at Singapore Airport, however, without any explanation, immigration authorities, those rascal immigration authorities, they flatly refused Srila Prabhupada and his entourage entry into the country. Nanda Kumar spoke to the head man, a Chinese official, Mr. Bajwani, who was there to greet Srila Prabhupada, along with a whole batch of other people, um, also tried frantically to appease the authorities, but they were unrelenting and would give no reason Prabhupada and the devotees could not enter Singapore. Prabhupada sat down in the crowded transit lounge, disappointed and feeling ill, while Shamasundar went to try to book a flight to Sydney. Prabhupada had often complained about immigration officers who, totally ignorant of spiritual etiquette, would question a sadhu at the border. He compared them to barking watchdogs. Yo, 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 where is your visa? Ro, ro. Formerly, he had explained, a sadhu would be allowed unhindered entrance, even to a king's palace. In the course of preaching, certainly Prabhupada was prepared to undergo difficulties, but this unequivocal refusal of entry, without any reasons, was particularly disturbing. Nanda Kumar recalls, as Shamasundra was trying to arrange an onward connection, because they couldn't leave the airport, I stayed with Prabhupada, who described his symptoms as dizziness and nausea. I suggested that he might like to take a little fruit. Yes, he said, maybe that will help. I cut one orange and he ate it, and afterwards he said, I feel totally refreshed. He spoke some nice philosophy, explaining how Krishna was so expert that he had produced this fruit, a perfect airtight package full of sweet juice. Just see, he said, after one orange, I am completely relieved of all trouble. Shamasundar had managed to book a flight to Sydney via Perth, which is uh, quite a, still quite a long way eight hours from Singapore, probably nine hours from Singapore to Perth, and then five hours from Perth to Sydney. Prabhupada had to undergo all these great austerities at an, as an, at an elderly age for our benefit. Um, and the flight was leaving in another four hours' time, so they had, there was a long way to go. Shamasundra wanted to ring the Sydney temple and warn them that Prabhupada's coming early, but had no telephone number. He sent a telegram ahead, Instead, advising of the updated arrival time. Telegrams were the thing that you did in those days. There was no WhatsApp. There was no uh, message services other than telegrams. Although Prabhupada appeared tired, he did not sleep during the remaining hours before arriving in Sydney. Nanda Kumar recalls, I was, as usual, impressed with Srila Prabhupada. As soon as we got aboard the plane, he would immediately we would immediately go to sleep. But Prabhupada would chastise us. Why are you wasting time? Why don't you read? Take my books and read, he would say. The flight to Perth arrived very early in the morning. That's right, it's like a 1 or 2 a.m. arrival in Perth. I've, I've done this route before. Prabhupada decided to bathe and sent Nanda Kumar to find a bathroom. Prabhupada's shower was brief. There was only cold water. But he emerged looking refreshed for the remaining four-hour flight to Sydney. 83 Hereford Street, Glebe. That uh, address rings a bell, of course. Spent many happy years there. 83 Hereford Street, Glebe. Easter Friday, 31st of March, 1972. The devotees in Sydney had worked hard to transform the little cottage in Glebe into Radha and Krishna's temple. The devotee population had more than tripled in only six weeks. And, excuse me, spirit, <coughs> <coughs> spirits were high. A new altar had been built for Radha Gobinath, as well as a new Vyasasan for Srila Prabhupada. Trees and shrubs were being planted in the garden, and painting and decorating were going on full swing. As you might have recalled from last reading, Sydney Temple and Melbourne Temple were engaged in a transcendental competition. Who could make the temple nice, nicest for Prabhupada? 
Sydney wanted Sydney Temple to be beautiful and Melbourne wanted their temple to be even more beautiful. Prabhupada said, that is, that is spiritual competition. Jan, now Jagatarini, had married Burijan, an older disciple of Srila Prabhupada, and had been assisting her husband in spreading Krishna consciousness in Hong Kong. For Jagatarini, living in Hong Kong was austere. It was austere for, for Burijan too. It was a very austere time, Burijan has written in his book about those years. To gain a little relief, she had requested her husband to allow her to return to Australia to visit her parents in Melbourne and then be present for Srila Prabhupada's tour of Australia. Today she sat in on a post-breakfast meeting arranged by Mohanananda to discuss preparations being made for Prabhupada's visit, which was scheduled in a few days' time. At one stage, a devotee entered the room and handed Mohananda a telegram, which he casually opened. Suddenly his jaw dropped. Prabhupada was arriving that day. They had not expected him in. they had not expected him until Sunday. And what's more, so this was Friday. This is Friday morning. Um, and what's more, Shama Sundar had mentioned an arrival time in the telegram, which was already two hours past. That means by the time they read the telegram, Prabhupada had already landed. This was, uh, this was not an unusual circumstance for Prabhupada's visits. We were always on the edge of our seat. The devotee uh, community erupted in panic. As Mohanananda frantically announced the news, Jagatrini ran outside to arrange a car to pick up Srila Prabhupada. After a few minutes, a small greeting party of devotees with a hastily made garland sped off down Hereford Street towards the temple. Sorry, towards the airport. On Prabhupada's arrival at Sydney Airport, Sydney Customs confiscated a new clay drum brought by Nanda Kumar for the temple. They were very good at confiscating, chastising. Um, since the heads of the drum were made of rawhide, they said the drum would have to be quarantined and could be picked up a few days later. Quarantine means, practically speaking, destroyed. That's how it always usually turned out. They used to spray it with all sorts of things and then it, the drum would fall apart a few days later. After completing air arrival form formalities, Prabhupada and his party had exited the arrival lounge but found no one there to greet them. Hmm. Hmm. A common, as I said, mistake that we made. We messed up so many arrivals. Unfazed, Prabhupada suggested they take a taxi to the temple. Prabhupada was always pragmatic. Well, we're not going to wait um, for the devotees to arrive. He said, we're going to head straight to the temple. Harry, yet to become Harry Sori, recalls, I'd been quickly detailed to sweep out the bus, which would soon be taking the devotees to the airport, or so they thought. Suddenly, Raghunath jumped aboard, screaming, He's here! He's here! He's here! I threw down my broom and I ran into the street, just as a black taxi pulled up. Some devotees prostrated themselves on the road. Jagatrini burst into tears. Mohanananda ran from the temple and, reaching into the front passenger window of the taxi, garlanded Prabhupada with shaking hands. All glories to you, Srila Prabhupada, he said in an emotion-choked voice. He attempted to apologize, but Prabhupada assured him that there was no problem. Harry recalls, as Srila Prabhupada got out of the car, Mohanananda, very emotional and crying, suddenly embraced Srila Prabhupada with his arms. Even though this was not the proper etiquette for a disciple, Prabhupada didn't say anything, nor did he shrug him off or shrink away. Mohanananda was a very flamboyant person and a little eccentric, but since he was displaying such true emotion of love for Srila Prabhupada, Prabhupada took it very nicely and just stood there humbly, end of quote, from Hari Sori. While Hari assisted Prajumna in taking Srila Prabhupada's luggage and storing it temporarily in the temple shop, Prabhupada stood surrounded by adoring devotees, most of whom were seeing their spiritual master 
for the very first time. Many were struck with Prabhupada's gentle demeanor. Although quiet and sober, he was completely in charge. He seemed to be totally in control of his senses, yet soft at the same time and without passion. The devotees noticed how brilliant Prabhupada looked and how meticulously he was dressed. He wore saffron shoes that matched his shiny saffron cloth. He appeared aristocratic with his head held slightly back. He carried a cane. He wore a long garland and was impeccably clean. As the devotees stood lovingly by, Prabhupada reciprocated with smiles and fatherly, affectionate glances. Mohanananda suggested a tour of the property. Prabhupada assented with a slight sideways movement of his head, accompanied by a dozen or so devotees. I was there. There's some nice pictures of this actually. Prabhupada taking a tour of the temple. Very nice temple, and very nice photographs taken by Amogadas. Accompanied by a dozen or so devotees, Prabhupada entered the front yard through a creaky wrought iron gate walking down the winding front path and following a route that led down the side of the building, he emerged into what had, excuse me, until recently been a double tennis court. No tennis for for the devotees. Uh, The tennis court had been torn out because the tennis court was Maya, as far as we were concerned. And uh, now it was just a, a, a yard full of rubble. Prabhupada's party crossed the yard, passing an old derelict house on the left, and approached some ramshackle sheds at the back right hand of the property. It used to be a very, very old uh, stables. It was a building with stables out the back for horses. Brahmacharis used to sleep in the stables. This is our incense factory, Srila Prabhupada, Mohan Ananda proudly announced as Cheru ran forward to open the shed door for a quick inspection. Prabhupada stopped as Cheru picked up a piece of wood and began began bashing a small plank that wedged the rickety door shut. Oh, said Srila Prabhupada in mock surprise, you have to break in? And the devotees laughed. The door sprang open and Prabhupada peered inside at the rows and rows of incense drying on chicken wire racks. The combined smell of carnation, licorice, bubblegum, strawberry, cherry, lime, patchouli and watermelon was overwhelming. Mohanananda was effusive. We sell this incense wholesale to big stores, Srila Prabhupada. We market it as spiritual sky. Krishna makes the best sense. People love it. Prabhupada nodded. He seemed to approve of the industriousness and enterprise of the operation. Next, they showed Srila Prabhupada a small printing press that was installed in one of the small rooms out the back. And Srila Prabhupada appeared impressed. Prabhupada was always impressed with printing presses. Passing the bookshed, someone handed Srila Prabhupada the latest copy of Back to Godhead magazine. They recrossed the rather sparse backyard and entered the small shop front that had once been a grocery store at the fore of the semi-detached building next door to the temple. Mohanananda described to Srila Prabhupada how he planned to sell books there. For the moment, the devotees had a small supply of bead bags, incense, a few racks of thin Indian cheesecloth clothing. Prabhupada smiled, pleased, and asked a few questions. By this stage, many more devotees had joined the touring party. Prabhupada next visited Vaibhavi's art studio. Vaibhavi Devi Dasi, of Churu and Vaibhavi fame from Utah, and uh, Vaibhavi still painting to this very day, 50 years later. A small cluttered annex between the temple and the shop front made up Vaibhavi's art studio. A half-finished painting of Krishna and Arjuna on the chariot stood on an easel. The room was untidy, and Prabhupada said nothing. Mohan Ananda had been saving the very best thing for last. Now, back at the front gate, Mohan Ananda proudly indicated his ultimate preaching tool, the double-decker bus. It was impressive. Bright orange. 
As Prabhupada stepped on board, his eyes opened wide and his eyebrows lifted slightly. He walked halfway up the stairwell and looked back. Um, he looked into the top deck. Those old Sydney double-decker buses, you go up and when you got to the, there was like a landing halfway up the stairs, like a spiral staircase almost, and then you could look in to the top floor of the bus. So Prabhupada walked all the way there. He looked around and he said, hmm, I could live in this. And the devotees laughed. Standing with his left arm on the polished stainless steel pole, if you remember those buses, there was a big stainless steel pole. As you got into the bus, that's what you held onto. And um, there's a beautiful picture of Prabhupada standing in, in that position. Prabhupada commented how much he appreciated the preaching potential of such a bus and the concept of having a traveling temple. That was the concept. It would be a temple. The devotees would live on the bus. They would travel all over Australia. And, uh, and indeed they did. And Prabhupada encouraged Mohanananda to push on with the project. Prabhupada's tour finished at the front of the temple building. He quickly walked up the three or four marble steps, which were lined with olive green glazed tiles decorated with ceramic grape leaves. They crossed the small cream and red tiled veranda. He was followed close behind by Raghunath's seven-year-old son, Radha Raman, who wore a small Prabhupada hat and carried a little pink flag. On the veranda, Prabhupada noticed the Radha Krishna temple sign adorned with lotus petals and swans, which Vaibhavi had nicely produced. Prabhupada entered the hallway. Slipping off his saffron canvas shoes, he paused momentarily, glancing up at the pink and yellow pastel walls, the small framed paintings and lead light windows above the doorways. It was a beautiful old house and we had done a good job. In the old, old days, all the temples used to be painted in pastel, bright pastel colors. No subtlety at all. Everything was bright pink, bright blue, bright green, bright orange. And Prabhupada thought it was nice. Uh, he then proceeded to the temple room with its highly polished wood floor and finally to the deity room with its highly, uh, with its, uh, which was separated from the temple by an arched wall. Um, there used to be a wall there, but uh, we had demolished it. It used to be the dining room and the living room. And uh, I think we had um, smashed the wall down and made it into one big room, even though we were renting, <laughs> this is what we did, um, which was separated from the temple by an arched wall. It was now an arched wall. Previously, it was just a wall. There, Sri Sri Radhagopinath stood resplendent on a lace-covered lotus, uh, a lotus petal throne, a mirrored slab beneath their lotus feet. Above them hung an ornate square red canopy embroidered with multicolored flags bordered by golden tassels. Quite an improvement from the year before. Prabhupada stood reverently, hands clasped together in respect. The deities were dressed simply but attractively, Krishna in a golden dhoti and turban and Radharani in a matching sari. The morning sun, shining through the bay windows, directly behind Radha Gopinath, was filtered through elaborate gold-painted wooden latticework and shiny translucent pink lace curtains. On either side of Radha and Krishna stood a large vase full of fresh flowers. In front of Radha Gopinath were a couple of cream-coloured marble steps, the upright surface of which was upholstered in shimmering gold cloth. At the front of the altar were two wide wings similarly upholstered. On the left-hand wing, on a circular piece of pink marble under an embroidered canopy, the same shade, stood a picture of Lord Chaitanya and his associates, along with pictures of Srila Prabhupada and Srila Bhaktisiddhanta. The right-hand side of the altar uh, stood a mirror image, um, uh, sorry, the right hand of the altar, a mirror image of the left, housed the smiling forms of Lord Jagannath, Baladeva and Subhadra. Prabhupada looked admiringly at the whole arrangement. 
highly polished brass RT utensils. We were, we were encouraged to polish the brass actually every day. In fact, I was, I used to, uh, I was the Pujari assistant in those days. And Deepak used to wake me up at two in the morning. That's right, two in the morning to polish the brass. He was taught that the, the brass had to be all polished on the altar for Mangal Arati at 4.30. So that became my service. Polish the brass at 2 a.m. It's made me what I am today, sleep deprived. Highly polished brass Arati utensils, a bell, spouted pot, incense burner and a lamp lined the three top marble steps at the very front of the altar. The entire deity room floor was covered with neat, gleaming white floor tiles. The walls were yellow, the skirting board were trimmed with gold. It was gorgeous, certainly a contrast to Radhagopinath's Spartan beginnings one year before. Prabhupada offered his full obeisances on the floor. That means dandabat, that means lying down on the floor like a stick. And the devotees immediately did the same. Prabhupada sat on his Vyasasan, which had been placed with the deity room to his right. He commented to Mohanananda that it should have been placed on the opposite wall, keeping the deities to his left, and later he requested that they move it. As Prabhupada sat on his pink and gold paisley Vyasasan, under a gold canopy he smiled brightly and turned to Shama Sundara. Look how nicely they're taking care of Radha and Krishna. The temple quickly filled as devotees filed in, taking their seats on the floor in front of Prabhupada because some devotees were already, had already realized that Prabhupada was already there and they turned around and came back or else they got to the airport and found it was all, the planet changed. But the devotees who had raced off came back and everyone started filling up the temple. The temple quickly filled, devotees filed in, taking their seats on the floor. Prabhupada turned to Cheru, who is taking care? He said, indicating the deities with his eyes. Vaibhavi, Chiru answered, his wife. Prabhupada spoke affectionately. When I last left, he said, I prayed to Lord Krishna. You please give help to these boys and girls, all malechas, to worship you nicely. Now, I am very happy to see that he has given you such good intelligence. Everything is very nice. So, just like I, when I read that story to you in oh, three, perhaps four episodes ago, or perhaps two or three episodes ago, Prabhupada, when he left, he prayed silently in front of the deities. And then I mentioned what he had prayed, and I mentioned to you that how do we know that what he said, because it was, it was a silent prayer. But he told us, and he told us on a number of occasions, including this one, what he was praying. And Krishna had fulfilled his prayers. Because, because Krishna had indeed given all his young boys and girl disciples the intelligence to do all these wonderful things, to build an altar, to sew canopies, to paint, make gorgeous arrangements. So uh, this was transcendental activities. <coughs> Where is Upendra? asked Prabhupada. Someone answered that he was at the house preparing Srila Prabhupada's lunch. <clears throat> so Prabhupada was actually staying at a separate house and um, he was not going to be staying in the temple because there were not sufficient rooms. Srila Prabhupada seemed extremely relaxed. You can see pictures of this. He was looking very relaxed. Relaxing on the Vyasasan. Now you have to remember that he'd been traveling for like 19 hours but he didn't appear to have been even slightly tired. Whereas his disciples were completely and utterly jet-lagged, the ones that had travelled with him, they didn't know if it was day or night. Prabhupada never suffered from anything like jet-lag. He just seemed completely aloof and transcendental. Prabhupada ex seemed extremely relaxed and surrounded by the devotees, appeared like a king amongst adoring subjects, a father of a family of 50 sons and daughters. He was witnessing firsthand the success of the Sankirtan movement in Australia. He had planted the seeds of bhakti one year previously, and now those seeds were sprouting. Prabhupada's bliss and satisfaction increased to see that his disciples 
By sincerely following his orders, we're advancing in Krishna consciousness. The power of Krishna Kirtan was transforming the fallen souls of Australia. His approving smiles increased the ecstasy of the assembled devotees. When Prabhupada had first entered the temple, Jagatarini had quickly removed a pair of Prabhupada's slippers from the footstool before his Vyasasan. Because now, of course, Prabhupada was actually wearing slippers. These were the ones that we would uh, offer flowers to in his absence. Jagatarini now sat crying before Prabhupada, still clutching the slippers. Prabhupada turned to Mohanananda. Who is that? That's Burijan's wife, replied Mohanananda. Prabhupada's eyes opened wide and his face lit up as he looked around the room. Oh, is Burijan here? Mohanananda explained that although Burijan could not make it, he had sent his wife instead. Prabhupada smiled affectionately at Jagatarini. He spoke to her in a semi-serious, soft voice. Oh, you haven't been fighting, have you? Jagatarini had the feeling that Prabhupada knew her mind, but she couldn't admit that she did indeed fight regularly with her husband. She felt like a cheat as she answered him, Oh, oh no, Prabhupada, he sent me here for some association. Prabhupada's face displayed a playful mock seriousness. Good. A husband and a wife should not fight. Prabhupada appeared to wait a few moments to let the point sink in. He continued with a slight twinkle in his eye, his finger raised in a caricature of chastisement. Would have been his right finger. Actually, when husband and wife fight, it shouldn't be taken very seriously, he said. He's probably speaking in front of the whole room full of devotees here. It is just like sometimes in the morning, there will be thundering in the clouds, but everybody knows that there will be no rain. He gave the example of how Mahatma Gandhi, after an argument, had thrown his wife out of the house saying, get out, get out. She had gone, but sat outside the house for the full day. Because she had nowhere else to go, she simply remained there. Towards the evening, Gandhi had come out, and seeing that his wife was still sitting there, he called her back inside. Prabhupada concluded, in this way, when husband and wife fight, it should not be taken seriously. Prabhupada continued to speak encouragingly to the assembled devotees, expressing his pleasure at how much effort they had extended or expended in decorating the temple. We had indeed. How much effort? Days, weeks, weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks. Sleepless nights. Finally, Prabhupada led a short kirtan, uh, Prajumna led a short kirtan, and then Prabhupada rose and left the temple room closely followed by Radha Ramana, who was still clutching his little pink flag. Prabhupada left via the front door and departed for his place of residence. <clears throat> Wally, a teacher, and his wife Kerry, who later became initiated next year as Vyasadeva and Kalki, Wally, a teacher, and his wife Kerry and their two young children had been regularly attending the temple programs. Although Kerry was not so committed to Krishna consciousness, they had both agreed to move out of their home in Paddington and let Prabhupada stay in it for the duration of his visit. Number 26 Rennie Street was a small two-story white terrace house, typical of many in the area, very traditional Sydney architecture. Um, actually, number 26 Rennie Street is still there. The temple building at 83 Helvet Street is no longer there. It was demolished many years later and had become a block of flats. I remember visiting all these old temples for my research for this book and uh, 83 Hereford Street didn't exist. It was now 80 to 85 uh, Hereford Street and it was a huge block of flats, a block of units as they call them. And um, 26 Rennie Street, still there, still looks identical. And that was Prabhupada's residence for this visit. It was a small two-story white terrace house, typical of many in the area. The well-lit front upstairs room with a veranda overlooking the pleasant tree-lined street 
was set aside as Prabhupada's room. Nandakumar and Shamasundara, his personal assistants, stayed in another room, downstairs with a large living room and a small kitchen. Devotees were still making final preparations as Prabhupada's car pulled up at the front. As Srila Prabhupada entered the house, Upendra, who had been cooking Prabhupada's lunch, came running out of the house and offered his obeisances. Prabhupada was very happy to see him. He was always happy to see Upendra. Uh, he reached down and patted him affectionately on the head. To get an affectionate pat on the head by Prabhupada was very special. Srila Prabhupada, looking fresh, amazing, as I said, since he'd been traveling for so long, walked energetically to his quarters. Shama Sundar, Prajumna, and Nandukumar, feeling jet lagged and exhausted, staggered to theirs. Srila Prabhupada returned to the temple that evening to attend the seven o'clock RT ceremony and to give a class on Bhagavad Gita. As he entered the small temple room, he was pleased to see it packed with guests and devotees. The Vyasasan had been moved so that now it could sit with Prabhupada's left side to the altar, which was the appropriate placing. Um, Prabhupada nodded approvingly. The Pujari blew a big pink and white conch shell, huge conch shell, it was about this big. Um, it was actually not a conch, but it was, I think it was a whelk. Um, but it still made a pretty good sound. The red velvet curtain swished open, revealing the deities. After offering prostrated obeisances, Prabhupada stood. Powerfully built Nandakumar picked up a clay madanga and began to sing the evening arati prayer. Srila Prabhupada remained standing and glanced at Shama Sundara, who opened a small velvet bag and passed Srila Prabhupada a highly polished pair of kartals. Prabhupada played deftly, and there's a beautiful picture of this also. Prabhupada standing uh, in front of the altar. It was a side-on photograph, and he's playing kartals. Gorgeous pictures. Prabhupada, uh, they're in this book, by the way. You should get a copy. Prabhupada played deftly, head slightly to one side, as he stood, looking lovingly and attentively at Sri Sri Radhagopinath on their beautiful new altar. After continuing like that for a few minutes, Prabhupada sat down on his Vyasasan and chanted with the Kirtan. It wasn't often that Prabhupada stood during the Arati, but he did. After 40 minutes, the jubilant Kirtan drew to a close. Srila Prabhupada opened up his Bhagavad Gita, set on a simple wooden book stand, balanced atop two, velvet, two red velvet covered steps in front of him. Wally, sitting on his right, set up the heavy reel-to-reel -reel tape equipment. So we were, we were okay with recording these lectures. We had heard that you have to record everything that Prabhupada said, and so we did. Because it was reel-to-reel, -reel and these things were not compact. They weighed about 40 kilos or 50 kilos. Wally, sitting in onto his right, set up the heavy reel-to-reel -reel tape equipment, ready to record the class. And sometimes we'd uh, get the whole class in and sometimes the tape would run out and before Prabhupada's finished speaking. And if, if you recall those reel-to-reel -reel tape recorders, the reel would start spinning around with the tape on it, flapping, flapping, flapping. It was, and uh, that was the, that was the uh, notice that the tape had run out. Prabhupada again picked up his shiny cartels, wrapping the red straps deftly around his fingers, closing his eyes, and striking the shiny brass symbols in the familiar one, two, three, one, two, three fashion. Satisfied after the, oh, sorry, seated amongst the crowd of devotees, Jagaturini was feeling completely satisfied after the joyous kirtan, as she recalled in her interview with me for this book. Jagaturini had almost forgotten a secret desire that she had been maintaining for a long time. What was that, you ask? Considering herself a good singer, which she was, she had hoped one day to sing for Srila Prabhupada. Nandakumar, seated next to Prabhupada on the floor, had scarcely placed the heavy clay madanga on his lap when Prabhupada suddenly stopped playing his cartels and opened his eyes. Scanning the silent crowd for a few brief seconds, his eyes fell on Jagatarini. 
seated close by. You lead, he said. Mohanananda looked at Shama Sundar in amazement. Jagatarini could hardly believe it. She swallowed and sang Jai Radha Madhava Kunja Vihari as loudly and as nicely as she could. Srila Prabhupada and the devotees sang the response. Srila Prabhupada's kartals chimed sweetly as Nandakumar increased the tempo with his rhythmic Madanga beats. Very, very good Madanga player. The song reached its climax and stopped. Jagatarini, her desire fulfilled, opened her eyes to see Srila Prabhupada staring at her intently. Krishna has been so merciful to you, he said, and began his evening class. Prabhupada was very, very affectionate to Jagatarini. After the discourse, Srila Prabhupada again glanced lovingly at the altar. Radha and Krishna were wearing impressive hand-crafted crowns of soft blue and pink stones, the whole effect reminiscent of Mother of Pearl. He looked around the room. Who has made these crowns? Rasarani flushed and slightly raised her hand. Srila Prabhupada smiled and said, Very nice. Prabhupada was always, was always lovingly um, bringing out the best in all of us, always encouraging us. Saturday, the 1st of April, 1972. Next morning. The sun had just risen when Srila Prabhupada arrived at Centennial Park. Very famous place, Centennial Park. Seeing that he had enjoyed his visits there last year, the devotees had chosen it again as a venue for his early morning walks. The park, the largest public reserve in Sydney, was named in 1888 to celebrate 100 years of settlement by Europea Europeans in Australia. The Australians had only been in existence, at least the Westerners in Australia, not the original inhabitants, had only been there since 1788. Previously, the indigenous population of Australia had been there for like 60,000 years. So, but nevertheless, we claimed it as our, as our own, as we, as we did uh, in our arrogance. So in 1888, Centennial Park was named um, to celebrate 100 years of settlement by Europeans in Australia. With its lakes, lawns, paths and statues, Centennial Park still re retained its 19th century ambiance. Prabhupada walked fast, which he always did, and spoke very little as the cluster of devotees followed his example by softly chanting Japa. Arthur ran ahead, crouching down behind trees. Arthur was going to become Ajamila Das, whom some of you may know. But he was still back to Arthur and he was a bit of a cameraman. And he had a camera, which was unheard of. It was a little Super 8, tiny little camera. And he took some pictures, including this lovely one on the front, which is Prabhupada walking on his morning walk with the cluster of devotees following him behind. Classic picture. Um, yes. He did indeed. Prabhupada appeared not to notice him. Prabhupada's silence appeared impenetrable. Sometimes Prabhupada would talk and talk and talk on a morning walk. Sometimes he didn't say a word. As he had written in the Nectar of Devotion, a person who doesn't express his mind to everyone or whose mental activity and plan of action are very difficult to understand is called grave. Prabhupada's demeanour certainly matched this description. The pathways were long and straight, with well-trimmed lawns on both sides. Tall, mature palms lined the path of intervals. at intervals. Some palm fronds had dropped off and were lying across the path, as they do. 
thinking that it would inconvenience Prabhupada to have to step over them or around them, Harry ran ahead without asking anyone, a daring thing for a new devotee to do, and removed the fronds from the path. Prabhupada said a good servant is one who understands the mind of the master before even being asked to do something. But in those days we were not aware of this, these subtleties. But Harry was. And he removed all the palm fronds from the path. As he rejoined the group, Srila Prabhupada nodded his approval. Prabhupada appreciated us using our uh, God-given intelligence to do things. Harry was thrilled to have achieved Srila Prabhupada's appreciative recognition. If Prabhupada even just looked at us and smiled, that would make our day or week or month or year. Towards the end of the walk, Prabhupada stopped. Turning to Mohana Ananda, he commented, This is better than New York's Central Park, he said. Later, Mohan Ananda took Srila Prabhupada for a short tour of Sydney, showing him some of the spots where the devotees would regularly perform congregational street Sankirtan. He, would, he, he drove Srila Prabhupada. He didn't, they didn't walk. Turning into Parramatta Road, Parramatta Road, uh, one of Sydney's busiest travel um, traffic routes, Prabhupada noted the trucks buses and cars that hurtled along in a frenzied rush. Prabhupada laughed, joking at the ironic similarity between Paramatta and Paramata, the Sanskrit word for extremely mad or crazy. Paramatta Road. Paramatta Road. Crazy Road. Srila Prabhupada planned to stay in Sydney for a few days before going on to Melbourne, only an hour's flight away. He had already noticed that although the Krishna consciousness movement was young in Australia, there were many positive signs of improvement. There were devotees to initiate, television and radio appearances planned, and a large interested crowd at his first evening lecture on Bhagavad Gita. And interestingly enough, we don't have uh, that first morning lecture recorded because I think what happened uh, that I think what happened that night is that Wally didn't record the lecture. I think something went wrong with the reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder because there were no recordings of that class, much to his chagrin, no doubt. A second evening class was similarly well attended. Before commencing, Srila Prabhupada made another favorable comment about the deity worship. Radha Gopinath were dressed in a, in a beautiful, lacy, peach and blue coloured outfit with silver trim. Again, Prabhupada asked, who has made? And this time, Rishab Dasi was the fortunate recipient of Prabhupada's appreciation. After the class, during question time, a lady who had been reading Bhagavad Gita asked Srila Prabhupada, who, uh, why is your Bhagavad Gita any better than anybody else's Bhagavad Gita? That's a quite a bold question. Prabhupada turned to the woman and replied, because it's not my Bhagavad Gita, he said. This is Bhagavad Gita as it is. It's not Bhagavad Gita as you like, or Bhagavad Gita as you might want it to be. It's Bhagavad Gita as it is. Good answer. Harry recalls, Prabhupada made a comment in the question and answer session that really stayed with me, he said. He said that these boys and girls have given their whole lives for Krishna. If I asked them to do anything, they would do it. That is Krishna consciousness. I remember feeling really proud that Prabhupada had said that. I was thinking, yes, we would. We'd do anything. I was thinking that if Prabhupada asked me to jump off a cliff, I would do it because I had that much faith in him. Luckily, Prabhupada didn't ask us to do that. Uh, we were totally absorbed in Prabhupada's presence for the whole week. That was my first realization of what Krishna consciousness must be like, recalls Harry. Somebody had described it as Prabhupada consciousness. It was a fact. All we were thinking about day and night was Prabhupada. Sunday, 2nd of April, 1972. This was the day that Prabhupada was supposed to arrive. So we were, we were lucky we got some extra days. 
And uh, Singapore was unlucky because they never got to see Prabhupada. And Prabhupada actually never got to visit Singapore. Um, they were uh, they were not destined, uh, they were not fortunate enough to get Prabhupada's lotus feet on their land. The devotees were given a special treat for morning class. Instead of speaking on Srimad Bhagavatam, Prabhupada decided to sing a bhajan, accompanying, accompanying himself on harmonium. <clears throat> As Shamasundara <clears throat> and Nandakumar played kartals and mridanga. It was an intimate setting. No guests were in attendance and the devotees felt themselves including, included in something rare and confidential. The evening classes were, guests were invited, but they weren't invited to the morning classes because I suppose we presumed it was too early for them. Prabhupada chose his favorite song, Hari Hari Bifale, by Narutama Das Thakur. He sang, eyes closed, and face tensed with deep feeling and emotion, his head shaking slightly as he deftly fingered the keyboard playing in a rarely heard, almost mystical melody. I actually got to hear fragments of that recording. I was only able, interestingly enough, when I did the research for this book, I found in some old cassette tapes, which were lying in a box somewhere in an abandoned room and, um, and so, now, of course, there were no cassette tapes in those days. But we, that song, that tune had been recorded on a reel-to-reel -reel and somebody later on, much later on, had transformed it to a, or transferred it to a cassette tape. But this cassette tape had become tangled up. You know what happens to cassette tapes and all the cassette comes out. And so this cassette tape was completely ruined and... I was thinking, how can I find out what's on this? So I gave it to my, and I, rem I remember um, speaking to my typist, because I used to uh, um, do my research for this book. I would write notes, and then I would record it on cassette tapes, and I would send the cassette tapes to the lady that was doing the typing. And I told her the story, how I found this cassette, and, and I was very disappointed because I couldn't, re I couldn't access it. And my typist said, well, Korma, she said, give me the tape. Because actually she, who's, and her name was, um, I've forgotten her name, very disappointing. She used to work for the police force, and she was a sergeant in the um, Sydney police. And she worked in the department that is involved with reconnaissance and a recording, probably secret recordings, although she didn't go into details. So she said, I, I have all the equipment. And she said, if you give me the tape, I'll see if I can fix it up for you. Normally these tapes were completely ruined. So she gave me the tape sometime later and I played it. And there was just a, f a few minutes that you could hear and the rest was un inaudible. And it was Prabhupada singing Hari Hari Bifale with an amazing, um, heavenly tune that I'd never heard before. It was only about 20 seconds. So um, there we have it. So I was able to hear slightly um, a little bit of that beautiful song. Um, rather going off the subject there, but not really going off the subject. Prabhupada sang his eyes closed and face tensed with deep feeling and emotion, his head slightly shaking as he deftly fingered the keyboard, playing a rarely heard, almost mystical melody. Afterwards, he opened his eyes. I will now speak on it, he said, and proceeded to give the, the song's meaning. Oh, Lord, hurry, he said. I have spent my life uselessly. Although I have taken this rare human birth, I have not worshipped Radha and Krishna, and so I have knowingly drunk poison. Prabhupada paused as he glanced around the room. There is so much depth of meaning, he said. The devotees settled in and listened with rapt attention for the rest of the class. In the midst of his activities in Sydney, Prabhupada continued to think of his spiritual children in various places throughout the world. And he, busily uh, he regularly wrote to them to Mandali Bhadra Das in Hamburg, 
who was busy translating Prabhupada's Bhagavad Gita as it is into German, he wrote, quote, I think the German people are very philosophically minded and they will appreciate the higher philosophy of the teachings of Lord Chaitanya or the science of the nectar of devotion. Actually, these four books, Krishna, teachings of Lord Chaitanya, nectar of devotion and Bhagavad Gita, if these four books are translated and distributed widely in the German language alone, they are sufficient to give everyone the whole contents of Krishna consciousness. To Revati Nandanadas, who recently passed away a few weeks ago. To Revati Nandanadas in London, he wrote, I'm very much pleased upon you for taking up the matter of preaching work in England, especially, and in other places. I'm happy to hear that new centers are being opened up by you and others in Europe. This is our best field. One thing, if we are not very careful to always stick to the point of regulative principles and purest standards of pure living, high living, then everything will spoil very quickly and the whole show will become a farce. So impress this point in your preaching for training the younger devotees. They will follow your examples in all respects. Unquote. Replying to Tamal Krishna Goswami and Jai Pataka Swami in Calcutta, quote, I'm very much encouraged by your progress in reporting stockpiling of materials. <clears throat> that means building materials. It appears that things are progressing at a good rate. And if you are determined enough to make a very perfect scheme there in Mayapur, Krishna will give you all encouragement to make all the necessary arrangements. So continue in this way, unquote. And of course, Krishna did make all arrangements in Mayapur. Now we have a Mayapur city. And to disciples in Brindaban, Prabhupada wrote, Now you work cooperatively for making our Brindaban a dazzling success and work together, all of you, for making this Brindaban project a heaven on earth. Unquote. Prabhupada was very happy with the Sydney Temple. He had taken the positive improvements as a sign of good spiritual strength in Australia. He wrote to Ham Hamsa Dutta in Germany, who also passed away last year. Now, you develop Germany very nicely, perfectly, and turn the whole nation into devotees. Also, your ideas for travelling in Sankirtan buses are very much liked by me. Here in Australia, they have got one double-decker bus like you have seen in the London streets. They have painted it very brightly, and as it moves there in Kirtan Party, chanting very loudly inside, and on the top floor there is a sleeping space and a kitchen. On the whole, it is so nice. I'm suggesting Dayananda that he supply you and Krishnadas with information how you may purchase such buses in London and drive them all over Europe. These Hare Krishna movement buses will make us famous all over the world. I'm enclosing one photograph of their Australia bus in Sydney. And Srila Prabhupada wrote to Gurudas and Yamuna in Brindavan. We are now in Australia and I am very glad to report to you that everything is going extremely well here. I am much satisfied with the progress being made in Western countries like Australia. Prabhupada also outlined his travel plans. We have finished now our business in India for the time being, so I am stopping here in Australia for some time, and then I shall return to Los Angeles for my translating work. I shall remain in Australia for about two weeks and then go to New Zealand. Prabhupada's instructions to Upendra were often in response to his mistakes. Although Upendra knew that Prabhupada preferred lightly seasoned prasadam, sometimes he would use too much ghee or spices. One time in San Francisco, Prabhupada had confided in his secretary that Upendra is using too much ghee. I cannot taste the prasadam before it slips down my throat, he said. It is too slippery. <laughs> Although devotees would sometimes cook him special items. Prabhupada was not interest, interested in fancy things. He preferred his simple diet, asking only for the regular items, dal, rice, chapatis and vegetables. Today, however, Upendra had cooked, had decided to cook something a little different, quote unquote. Bell peppers, or as they were called in Australia, capsicums, cooked with sugar. Woo! 
A recipe lifted straight out of the Australian Women's Weekly Cookbook. Now, that was a mistake. Um, Australia wasn't famous for its cooking back in those times. After lunch, Upendra learned his latest lesson via Nanda Kumar, who brought Srila Prabhupada's lunch plate downstairs with the all but untouched green mound still intact. The verdict, tell Upendra that bell peppers should be cooked with salt, not sugar. Upendra was predictably devastated. Bearded Allen Ginsberg, popular American beat poet and LSD promoter of 60s fame, was in Sydney for poetry recitals. He arrived at the temple mid-afternoon to see Srila Prabhupada. The devotees explained to him that Prabhupada was resting at his house. Allen Ginsberg left, promising to return later. However, he never returned. That's a, a, a door that was uh, never opened. I don't think Prabhupada actually ever met Allen Ginsberg again. So we'll leave it there. We've got l a lot more to cover, especially this visit to Australia in 1972. And then his visit to New Zealand is mm, probably 100 pages here. Uh, as I said before, a very well, um, a well recorded and um, well documented visit out of Prabhupada's six visits to Australia. So uh, thank you for listening. Thank you for attending today's recital of the great transcendental adventure. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Ram Hare Hare. Thank you very much.